Welcome to church. We're really glad you decided to join us today. Here at Pathway, we are a family of individuals who have found life in Jesus Christ and simply want as many people as possible to experience that exact same thing. Our church is made up of imperfect people with every kind of story imaginable. No matter where you are or what you've been through, we hope our church is a place where you'll find the love, grace, and forgiveness Jesus offers to everyone. So come as you are. At the end of the day, we're all about journeying together in life as we pursue wholeness in Christ. Welcome to Pathway Community Church. Hi everyone, I'm Tanisha. Welcome to Pathway Church. Today we have a guest speaker named Cord Penner. He's actually a professor at Steinbeck Bible College. So we are very excited to have him here, but we're gonna start with worship. So come on and join us. song. 
Got some announcements for you guys. Our first one is Gord Penner is gonna be here again next week, October 1st and 2nd. He's gonna be teaching an Old Testament Bible study course. It's gonna be held at the Winkler Bible Camp. It's $25, meals are included. You can sign up on the Church Center app or online at pathwaycc.net slash OT for Old Testament. Up next, we have our membership classes coming up soon. They're gonna be held mid-October. It's a two-night event. If you wanna become a member, this is the night for you, or the two nights for you, and Pastor Rob will be hosting it. It will be really fun, and if you want more information on it, it is on our Church Center app, you know the place. If you'd like to give the Pathway Community Church today, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can pay online through PayPal, set up automatic withdrawals, or you can send us an e-transfer. For more information and assistance on this, visit pathwaycc.net slash gift. And now we're gonna head into the message with Professor Gord Penner. The message you're about to hear was previously recorded at a different church, but is the exact same message that he is giving in person for us today. We will be putting our church's version online at a later date, so you can check that out then, or just watch this one now. But for now, Gord Penner. Sure glad that I can come, well, it feels like coming home. Uh, so many former students, uh, pastors that I've connected with in different churches. I see, I'm not sure if he's high level or Straffordville and Cola, and, and now he's here. Wanderers that come home. Uh, and then I see my brother, Glenn, who was my mentor, who my, uh, my teacher. Uh, 30 years ago, you guys moved to Lesotho. And that's when I got my start teaching Old Testament because uh, Glenn vacated the Old Testament teaching spot there at the college. So... Uh, Thank you for giving me a chance to start and then encouraging me along the way. We've had many a coffee and cinnamon rolls since then. Uh, and so good to see you guys again, too. And, and all of the rest of you. Uh, good to be here this morning. Yesterday, we had graduation at SBC on October the 17th. Never done that before. Uh, I was at Quarry Oaks out on the fairway, number one. I think that's where our president feels most at home. And so that's where we had graduation. And uh, the sun was out, and we were in the, in the bush on the fairway, so it was actually, there was no wind, and it was actually comfortable. We, I mean, I had my, my downfill jacket, but, but uh, there we were, and we had a great graduation yesterday. It was neat to see uh, our grads one more time. Uh, maybe we need to do this every year, that, we, that way we get to see them come home again. And so we uh, had a good graduation, and Levina's granddaughter graduated there, and, uh, and many others. Uh, it was a good day of celebrating. Uh, yesterday at SBC, and uh, this year we've already begun our new year, and we are so excited at the college uh, to see God sending students. We're we're up 15% from last year. Uh, people are hungry to study the Word. Uh, very exciting times uh, for all the things that we're nervous about in the world. There's some very healthy things going on. Uh, students that want to study. Uh, I when when I walked into the church, uh, Mo greeted me as Ha Gordos, because he took Greek with me, and so he wants to, you know, flip my name into Greek. But, uh, and I said to him, we have, uh, this year I have more, I have 15 Greek students who've never had that many in my life, uh, all the years at SBC. Uh, they're just hungry to study the Word. Um, and so I think that, that we don't know what the future holds, but there are people that are studying the Word and, and preparing to go out and serve in a needy world. And uh, it's very exciting to be part of that. So greetings from Steinway Bible College. Greetings from your sister church, Ridgewood EMC, where I'm a lay minister. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, the passage that was just read. Uh, Jesus, as they're walking along, he goes and explains to them, uh, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explains to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And he thinks that the whole Old Testament was teaching about himself. And yet we, we tend to forget 75% of our Bibles and many focus on the New Testament, and I often ask people, why is it that we do that? I think that you probably, from what it looks like here, you're all, you're all Old Testament and New Testament readers, but, but a lot of people tend to ignore or avoid the Old Testament, and, and I wonder sometimes, why is that? And this is interactive part. So there's some, I won't teach you actually anything new this morning. We're just going to pull out of out you stuff that you already know. Um, why is it that people tend to avoid their Old Testaments? Help me out. All the wars and the gore and nasty stuff, it's like, let's just, as my, as my dad used to always say at the, at the dinner table when you, it gets negative at the table, he says, well, there must be something positive to talk about. And so that's why we have the New Testament. It's like, okay, 
So the wars and that stuff. Anyone else? A lot of confusing prophecies. And when the prophets do speak, they're always angry and mad and yelling and, and ranting and, and telling the people dumb. So it's like, that's not, that's not the most exciting. Like, could be, like my dad would say, there must be something positive to talk about. Uh, anything else? But may, not the reasons why you, but maybe reasons why you hear other people. If only we could get people to, to tweet them in or something from out there, but I can't get that because we don't have that. Genealogies, yeah, and this person beget this one, beget this one, beget this one, and, and it's nice to, to finally get to the New Testament, which, you know, begins with something like uh, <laughs> this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abram. Abram was the father of Isaac and Isaac, but at least, but after chapter one, it gets better, at least. So, so I don't know, that's just like, we're just going to do one little. One little gesture to the Old Testament, and then we'll give you something new, right? So, yeah, so, but there is a lot of genealogies, and it's hard to memorize all of those names for an Old Testament test, right, students? Yeah, okay, which is why I don't do that. Anyone else? Leviticus, because we don't want to know what you do when, you, when we cross up a holy God that can't tolerate sin. How do you be made right with him? It's like, I don't want to know that. I just want to know about how we get right with... Oh, yeah, it's sort of the same thing, but it's... But the Leviticus, all the rules, right? All of those things. We don't do a lot of that stuff anymore. So Leviticus seems a little out of date. All right, anyone else? New Testament seems more relevant. Okay, because it's Jesus, and the answer to most questions is Jesus, and so there he is, right? Although he himself thinks that he was all over the old, but, but that's... What if? Anyone else? One more. Ah, because the Old Testament is disturbing because we see our relatives there. At least I find my relatives all over. It's like, oh yeah, that's like me. That's like me. That's like, and it's, and it's pointing out the rebellion of God's people, no less. It's not just a pagan world. I mean, it, the whole story is about God's people. And they keep on turning against God, turning against God. It's like, that's a nasty picture. I'm going to take a look. Let's go to the New Testament, where we watch Paul rebuking the church that keeps on forgetting God himself. But, but yeah, there's a lot of that in the Old Testament. That's good. Thanks. Well, we've, um, but we need to go to it because 75% of the Bible is, is Old Testament. And I had a professor in seminary once said, I, I dare you to find anything in the Old Testament that isn't already, in the New Testament that isn't already taught in the Old Testament. It's like whenever Jesus was preaching, guess what Bible he used? <laughs> the Old Testament. And if the Old Testament is what he was using to preach his message, there, there, must, there must be a lot of stuff from Jesus that he was teaching right there. So I want to uh, take a look. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, I see Brother Glenn there. I remember when he was at SBC, uh, forever. It was like 18 years. How many years did you end up spending at SBC, Brother Glenn? 19. 19. Yeah, I think it was in your 18th year. I still remember the day you walked into my office. You were teaching 1 Corinthians, and uh, you came and you said, Gord, it says, look at this. Look what, I, look what I found. It's something new. And I'm thinking, Glenn, you've been here forever. You've been teaching. What do you mean you found something new? And then I remember you t- talking to me about, about 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and about how we how we tend to analyze ourselves until the cows come home as to whether or not all of our motives are pure before we do something. And he says, but what does it say right here? And then he read to me, he says, and what is, and what is required is that, that we are faithful. If God calls you to do something, just do it. And, I, and for me, that was, an, that was an impactful day in my life, and that is to realize that, that you can be teaching 18 years forever, but every time that you open up the Word, it's fresh and it's new, and there's something else that God has to tell us. And so... So it never does get old, whether it's the old or whether, it, or whether it's in it. So I hope that this morning, as we go through a story that you've been taught all your life and you know, but hopefully as we go through it this morning, it's going to come alive in a, in a new way, again, for, for all y'all. So we start off the Old Testament then with whom? You have that little chart in front of you. And none of you have ever seen this chart before in this form. Some of you thought that you had. It looks familiar because you've been to Bunnan Springs. Any of you been to Abundant Springs? All right, and I see the lights are flashing on the camera. There's people out there that have been to. And so you think you've seen this, but you haven't. I changed something on it. 
because there was a mistake in every copy till now. And nobody caught it. A little disappointed. But the very first person on there is, who's, who does the Old Testament begin with? God. And he was on that other chart, but I had him in a box. And I realized, you can't put God in a box. There is no box big enough for God. So I removed the box. God is no longer a box in a box in my theology. He's, he's beyond the box. So the box is gone. If you have your copy from back in, the, in Springs days, you get rid of that box. You can't put a box around God. It's important. Sorry, Mo. Well, I had to sort of, I had to, how am I going to put it? It's like, okay, busted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that, and I'm just going to have it blue against the Okay, I, I still need to improve. Like, like, like Glenn points out, you still keep learning new stuff. I will change that for next time, I think. God is the beginning of everything. You don't start your Bible, you don't start history without understanding that God was there. That's the beginning of the Old Testament. He creates the first people. first people's names were Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, and he goes and he gives them this, these two trees, and, and, and then they're like me. And they go and they choose the only thing that they're not allowed to choose. When I was a kid, we went to, I went to Winnipeg, to the, to the pagan city of Winnipeg to visit my cousin Cheyenne and uncle and aunt there. And, and we were given money to go to Safeway and we were told you can buy any candy that you want. You just can't buy candy cigarettes, which I didn't even know existed. So that would have been no temptation for me, right? So we went to Safeway and I came back home and guess what I bought? Well, you've done this too, eh? It's the only thing that there was not, and that becomes the most tempting thing. Yeah, I bought candy cigarettes, and I brought them in, and then, of course, my conscience bothered me, and I confessed. But that's a different lesson, but, but, uh, but here's Adam and Eve. So I find, again, my start off the first story is my relatives, right? Choosing that, the very thing that God doesn't want us to choose. In fact, the thing that he forbids. Um, but we know the Old Testament God, see, is the God of justice, the God of wrath. And so they sin, and God, what does he do to them? He says, on, that, on the day that you eat from the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. So what happens on that day? They, they, they don't die that day, do they? They're removed from the garden spiritually. They're, they're estranged from God, but, but God is actually gracious to them. This is Old Testament stuff, but he's gracious. The very first story, and God chooses to continue. In fact, he pursues them. That's For me, that's one of the amazing things about God is when we walk away from him, he pursues us. He doesn't say, okay, fine. And he pursues Adam and Eve. And he says to them, he gives them instructions, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, Professor, I'm, now he's Pastor Ernie, my good friend, is out in Austin this morning doing a missions thing. I'm guessing he's probably spending most of his time in the you know, New Testament thinking that, and he's under the illusion that, that the Great Commission comes in Matthew 28. Well, I got news for Ernie. It's in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. God's concern for the earth is in Genesis chapter 1. And Ernie knows that. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And so they're fruitful and they multiply. And they have kids. Names are Cain and Abel. And then there's... That is on your paper. I put that on for you. All right, Cain and Abel and... And we have to include Seth because like, we're all descendants of Seth. But uh, here you've got Cain and Abel, and you've got the first ex example of murder. You all know what it says in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. He kills his brother. What does God do to Cain? He, he puts a mark on him so that he won't be killed. Grace. Second story of the Old Testament. Second story of God's grace as he actually chooses to protect Cain. We go on to chapter 6 of Genesis, where it says that every inclination of the thoughts of man were only evil all the time. And so God decides to start all over again, destroy mankind from the face of the earth, and begin from scratch. Except that he spares one. Who does he spare? Noah. And Noah was spared because he was perfect, correct? Correct. No, Fran is saying no. What was no? How is he described? Now, Noah was a... How is he described? Not as a perfect man. Noah was a righteous man. What's the difference between perfect and righteous? Any of us perfect? Anyone here perfect? No. Any of us righteous? How so? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so God makes us righteous, even though we are not 
perfect. Noah was described as such a man, a righteous man. Noah was a righteous man. God spares him his grace again. And when Noah comes off the boat, he's instructed to be fruitful, multiply, and there it is, great commission, one more time, fill the earth. And so his descendants are fruitful, and they multiply, and they say, but let's not fill the earth. And instead of filling the earth, what do they say? Say, hey, let's, let's all gather in Steinbeck. Oh, it wasn't called Steinbeck, but let's all gather in one place, and let's make a name for ourselves and build a tower. The name of the place was Babel. All right? Let's make a name for ourselves. Oh, my friendship. My relatives are, there they are again. How many of us concern ourselves with what other people think about us? Right? Let's make a name for ourselves. Who are we supposed to incidentally make a name for? To God be the glory. Right? So, anyways. Uh, and they also say, let's build this tower that reaches the heavens so we can control when God appears and where God appears because we like to be in control of God. Our relatives. And, uh, and so we won't be scattered. Four verses later. And the Lord scattered them. And he accomplishes this by now creating all of the languages besides Low German. Oh, we actually don't know what language they spoke before this. All we do know is we have the situation that we live in today, and that is one language group pitted against another language group. And so the Russian-speaking hockey players hate the, the Canadian ones, eh? And those ones hate the ones that speak Swedish. And, and because we just... We're, we got people against people. Does that problem ever get solved in the, in, in the Bible that lang one language group is against another language group? Does it ever get solved? No. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think so. It does get solved, doesn't it? Somewhere. All these languages were gathered one time. And, they, and a word didn't break out. Something else happened. Okay, it's in the New Testament. We cheated. We moved to the other one. Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost said there was God-fearing Jews from every nation gathered in Jerusalem. And when the Holy Spirit comes, they say, how is it that we all hear the word of God in our own language? And so the Holy Spirit undoes the results of Babel. And that's why when I go to Steinreich in Mexico and they're talking Tlotich or they're talking Espanol, or I can go, you can go to any country on the planet and some of you have done that and, and Glenn's been to Lesotho, and you, and, and you talk to people, and, and you're sitting there in church, and it's a different language, but you just, you're just blessed because the Holy Spirit is there, and it's the same Spirit. And you, are, and you are welcomed into their homes as a brother, as a sister, because you are a brother and a sister. We're the same family, regardless of languages. The Holy Spirit does that. So Babel sets the stage for that. Well, out of all of those language groups, God chooses one group as his, for instance, for his example to the world, what it looks like for, for them to be his people and for him to be their God. Does anyone know what language they speak? Hebrew. So they're known as the Hebrews. They're often referred to as the Hebrews. They're also referred to as the Jews. They're also referred to as the Israelites, or as the descendants of Abram. Abram and specifically his wife, Sarah. And so all of those need to fit into that. I know, I, I sue me. I, I apologize. It's a small box, but you have to put all four of those in there if you really want to get this. Okay? Um, and God makes a covenant with Abram, and he promises him three things in the covenant. Does anyone know what three things God promises to, to Abram in the covenant? That you will be a blessing. Thank you. That's a, that's a student over there. They're a student of the word. Right? Be blessed. Often people say that they'll be blessed. Um, God does bless us, but he calls us, he calls these people to be a blessing. What's the difference between being blessed and being a blessing? If, you're, if being blessed is all about me, and being a blessing is all about love your neighbor as yourself, right? Which begs the question, if we're God's people today, you wake up in the morning and say, like, so who does God want to bless today through me? As God's people, through us as God's people. And at the end of the day, you stop and you say, so in what ways did God use me or us to be a blessing to those around us? Because that's the call. So be a blessing. What are the two other things that were promised? Descendants, like the stars of the sky, the sand of the seashore. And the land, all right? So these three things are promised to, 
to uh, Abram and to Sarah. And then you're going to see these same promises promised to his son, whose name is Isaac, and Isaac and his wife, Rebekah. And the same three things are going to be promised to Isaac and Rebekah, to their one of their sons. What's the name of their sons? This is the, these are the first Mennonite twins. It's Jacob and Harry Esau. Doesn't work to say Esau and uh, uh, Harry and Jacob Esau, but it works to say Jacob and Harry Esau, and then you remember which one's Harry, right? It's Harry Esau and Jacob are the two brothers. All right, anyways, uh, I remember, you know, when I do Old Testament jokes, that man over there taught me. I still remember when Glenn was teaching Old Testament, and we was talking about Balaam's donkey, and he says, and so then, and so then Balaam got, got off his donkey. He says he got down off his donkey, and then Glenn says to us, he says, but everybody knows you can't get down off a donkey. You can only get down off a duck. And there's only two of us in the room, and everybody else was fast asleep. They're just missing these. So, so that's, where I, that's where I got my, my wonderful sense of humor from. Say it, Mo. No, you don't have to say it. Just stay honest. Um, and so it's, a, it's Jacob and Esau. Jacob, of course... Uh, marries Leah and Rachel, has these two combines, concubines, whatever they were. But as a result, he ends up having how many sons? Twelve. And the favorite one was Joseph. And so, and Joseph is the one that ends up leading the people down into Egypt. He invites his family to come to Egypt during the famine, and they're spared. 430 years later, they're in bondage, they're being slaves, and who's going to lead them out of Egypt? God will, but God's going to use Moses, right? And so God uses Moses to lead the people of the land, and, uh, and, and he says to Moses in, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, he says, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And I look at that, I'm thinking, well, if... if all of Israel is a kingdom of priests. Who are they priesting for? If you're a kingdom of priests. Because what's the job of a priest? Well, what's the job of a prophet? A pro job of a prophet is to take God's word and give it to the people. What's the job of a priest? To do all the stuff that, that uh, Diane doesn't like in the book of Leviticus. That is, to reconcile people, sinful people, to a holy God. Well, if they're a kingdom of priests, who are you left Priesting for? I guess it's the rest of the world then, eh? Again, we're back to the Great Commission. You're a kingdom of priests, right? Standing in the gap and so that these pagan nations, as they are drawn to Israel, Israel brings them to their God and they become Israelites. And all the way through the Old Testament, you have the, then the same law applies to the, to the Jew as to the foreign-born or to the alien. It's like, you're part of the people. Once you're reconciled to the holy God, and that's the job of the church. That's the job of Israel in the Old Testament is to, is to be a kingdom of priests. And so Moses, God uses Moses to lead the people out of the land. And who's going to lead them into the land? Yeah, you're, no, you're, it's going to be God. But who's God going to use this time? People that are faithful. And he uses Joshua. And they go into the land, and they settle in the land. They eat the produce of the land, and everything is great. Until they forget who gave them the land. One of the most disturbing verses I find in the Old Testament is Judges chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Turn with me to that one. Judges 2, verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> and it says, this is just after they've entered the land, Joshua's, Joshua and his generation dies. Uh, Joshua 2 verse 10, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither Yahweh, the God of Israel, nor what he'd done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Yahweh, and they served the Baals. But I asked myself the question, how could the generation that just moved into the land have forgotten who Yahweh is, who their God is, and that was God that gave them land? How do you forget that stuff? That was chapter 2. 10, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Judges 2, verse 10. How do you forget that stuff? 
How would, they, how would that next generation not know that it was God that gave them the land? They didn't talk about it. They didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have VBS. And the parents didn't read Bible stories to their kids. And that's why we do that. I always say that Christianity is a generation away from dead. If my generation doesn't pass it on to that generation right there, I see four students sitting there. If my generation doesn't pass it on to them, it's over. And you know what your generation's job is? You know it. And it's your job right, to, to teach the Sunday school classes right here. Whoever's a superintendent of Sunday school and BBS, that generation is looking to. It's their job. And, and we're always passing it on to the next generation. And we see the, the drastic effects when that doesn't happen. They didn't know about Yahweh, what he'd done for Israel. Then they did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they served the Baals. And so you end up having 12 judges, six extended stories of, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, worshiping the gods of their neighbors. And so God sells them into the hands of the Moabites, Ammonites, Philistines, and the, Men the Mennonites weren't there, the, um, the Ammonites, uh, the surrounding countries, and the people are oppressed by them. And so then they do what we always do when we get into trouble. It's like, God, help us. Now I'm in trouble. And they cry out to God, and God actually sends a deliverer or a judge. And he frees them, and then you go right back to, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord again. Until you get to the very last verse in the book of Judges, says, in those days, Israel had no king. That's what they thought their solution was. If we could only have a human king, that would solve this problem. And it conclu concludes with, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I look at that verse and I say, I think, I think we just hit that in North America in 2020. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And, and if that's what's right for you, who am I to say that that's not right for you? And, and, and if that's what you believe, who am I to say that's not the right thing? I mean, that's the right thing for you, and that's the right thing for you. And, and don't give me this stuff about, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. That's, and that might be the way for you. But you just need to respect always now in North America. And we end up with a problem. And we end up looking a lot like some people that look really, really relevant in the Old Testament, but they did something. They repented. Unfortunately, they didn't learn from it. And so we move on then to after these judges. At the end of it, they're hinting and saying, well, maybe if we had a king to lead us, that would solve the problem. So God actually goes with what they wanted. They had a king. They had the king of kings. But instead, they demand a human king, and God honors it. And he sends Samuel, who's the last judge, to anoint a king. And the first king's name then was Saul. And God says to them, you know what, as long as you can have a human king and as long as he follows me, all goes well. But he needs to follow me because I still am your king. And Saul was a good king for six days. And then he goes and offers up the offering that wasn't his to offer up and he disobeys. And so God rejects him as king and he chooses David. And David's described as a man after God's own heart. I ought to have an epitaph like that on my, on my gravestone. He followed God. That's all you need to put on there. He followed God. That was David, a man after God's own heart. And so God makes a covenant with David, and he says to him, never will you fail to have a descendant on the throne of Israel forever. Forever. That's a long time, which begs the question, who is on the throne of Israel today, and is that a relative of David or not? Because the promise is he will never fail to have a descendant on the throne. But let's just park that question for a little bit and just move on because he does have a descendant on the throne after him and his name is Solomon. And Solomon is known for three things that all start with the letter W. What are they? Wisdom, wealth, and wives or women. There's 700 wives, 300 combines or concubines, whatever it was, big time farmer, right? But this guy had women, right? And he marries foreign women which lead him to idolatry. And so he is told that when he dies, the kingdom, the ten tribes are going to be taken away from his son and will not follow him. And so when he dies, you've got the kingdom splitting into the north and the south. Up north, you've got Israel. Down south, you've got Judah. First king up north is Jeroboam. And the first thing Jeroboam does up north is he sets up a golden calf. Where did that idea come from? Mount Sinai. And where did they get that idea from? The Egyptians had had golden calves, that's what they worshipped, and so that worship now comes into Israel in the Promised Land. And every king after Jeroboam is described as 
And they walked in the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and the sins that he caused Israel to commit. And you've got 19 kings in a row up north that are going to follow Jeroboam and continue to worship these go at these golden calves. How long would you wait if you were God? How many kings would you put up with? I know for some of you as parents you, you, with your kids, it's like one, two, and, and we have a variety. Some of you, it's, it's three. We all know three. We hate that number. We're still shaking fear in our beds tonight when you hear number three because it's like, I know what that means. Or maybe for some of us, we had gracious parents and they counted to five, but it's all the same. But no, no parent has ever counted to 19 before they, before they, I don't know, the most discipline you could do right now is take an iPhone away for up to five minutes. That's the most, that's as, uh, beyond that is abuse, correct? So, so but, but you would do that before you get to 19, correct? And here's this gracious, long-suffering God that watches his people repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the sins of Jeroboam. Until finally in the year 722, northern Israel is taken into exile or wiped out by the Assyrians. And so meanwhile, back at the ranch, the last king up north is Hashia. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, southern Judah, David's line is on the throne. That was his son. Rehoboam is David's son. And he has a son. And every king after that down south is the son of David. And uh, there's going to be 20 of them. But the first thing that Rehoboam does when he sets up a golden calf is he, uh, he doesn't set up a golden calf. When he becomes king, the first thing that Rehoboam does is it says he sets up high places to worship foreign gods on every high hill and under every spreading tree. In Manitoba, that would be two. I mean, the dump here in Steinbeck and the dump in Winnipeg, those are the two high hills I've seen in, anywhere around here. Uh, but in Israel, it's, it's rampant. It's everywhere. All right? And so uh, idol worship is everywhere in the land. And the kings after, after uh, Rehoboam are described one of two ways. Either they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, or it says they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but they didn't remove the high places, the places to worship foreign gods. And God waits for 20 kings. Again, he counts one, two, and he's up to 20. Why does God wait and wait and wait and wait and wait? He's a gracious God. And he waits. The same reason that he waited for us, and he's waiting for our... That's why... Our world is still here. God is waiting. And what's he waiting for? He's waiting to see people come back to him. And so we pray. And so we tell. And that's why we have the mission of the church. And that is God's waiting. And as long as he's waiting, we got to get out there and tell people because there's still time. In 586, Zedekiah is the last king. The people end up in exile. They go to Babylon. But they only go for 20, 70 years. And then they return back to the land God brings them back, but they don't have a king like they had before. First, it's the, the, the Babylonians are defeated by the Medes and the Persians, and after that, it was the, the Romans, the, sorry, the Greeks, Alexander the Great. Uh, and then after that, in 70 BC, it was the Romans. And so when, when we get to the end of the Old Testament, when we, get, when we start our New Testament, the Romans are in charge, and we never do have that, that king like we had before. So whatever happened, we're left to the question mark. Whatever happens to the promise to David, Never will you fail to have a descendant on the throne of Israel. And then we get the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1. And you get this baby that's born. And in Luke chapter 2, it talks about how Joseph and Mary went to, to Bethlehem to be taxed because they were of the house and line of, I've heard this thing every Christmas, because they're of the house and line of D David. And there it is. And now you've got a baby born. And it's a pretty big deal that he's of the house and line of David. And when he hangs on the cross, the sign on the cross says, King of the Jews, forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords. And Jesus saw that coming, and he was explaining that to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he's teaching about himself. And Jesus becomes the answer to a promise that was made a thousand years earlier to David. And so if we're looking for the Great Commission, it's in the Old Testament. And God calls us to be his people. Faithful as priests to a world that needs priesting. To be reconciled to their God. And Jesus just goes and repeats the Old Testament story. And he says, now go from Jerusalem, Steinbeck, to Judea, 
find your neighbors to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And lo, I'll be with you just as he was with Moses. I'll be with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Lord God, I come before you and thank you that you are a God that is faithful, a God that has worked with your people throughout all of history, inviting them back to you and calling us to invite others to join us on the path. Lord God, I ask that you're going to remind us of your story of faithfulness in the Old Testament and that when we're going through this pandemic, when things in life don't make sense, that we would just be reminded that you are there and you are faithful and you don't change and that the King of Kings has come and reigns forever. And as we worship him, as we serve him, and as we tell our neighbors about him, may you be glorified on earth. Amen. Thanks for joining us at church today. We'd love to stay connected with you. There's a couple ways we can do that. You can either check out our social media pages or you can visit our website, which is, we've got a news page on there. It's pathwaycc.net slash news. It's a great place to find out what's going on in the church, what kind of events we have and just everything going on. So feel free to check that out. Have a great week, everyone. And thanks for coming.